thank you for having me. It's terrific to be here. It feels uh, different, but uh, equally important to have the forum in whatever form we can do. So thank you for giving up what is lunchtime here in the UK, perhaps morning and afternoon, wherever you happen to be. So what we're going to try and do here is a relatively whistle-stop tour of some of the lessons which I've taken from the last 18 months of my life in COVID response. And try and think of them in terms that are transferable, things that perhaps you can take away and use in whatever you're doing. Well, that might be COVID response. It might be something entirely different. If there aren't any lessons for you, then you've lost 45 minutes of your life and that won't be that bad. If there are, then I hope maybe you can take them back to you, your team, somewhere and and adapt them for your use. So let, let's try and think a little about where we are. So this is a quote about a pandemic. The pandemic which has just swept around the earth has been without precedent. There has been more deadly epidemic. You get the idea. More widespread floods, famines, earthquakes. So that could have been written in the Glasgow Herald, the local paper here where I live, or the Times, or perhaps in your local newspapers th this week, frankly. But it was written in 1919, the last time the world saw anything remotely like what we're going through just now. And if, if you are less than 102, you have never known anything like this. It is an entirely unique moment in world history in the modern era. Nobody has ever lived through anything like this. So let's try and put it in perspective, shall we, before we go through some of the things I've been forced to learn and some of the things I'm maybe learning in retrospect. This is Tedros. Tedros is the Director General of the WHO. You'll have almost certainly have seen him. He's the former Ethiopian Health Minister, and he was in the seat when the music stopped. He was the public health leader of the world when the pandemic struck, and I think he's done a fantastic job corralling 197 countries, member countries of the WHO, into what has been an astonishing global response. Now, ups and downs, not perfect, clearly criticisable, both in Scotland and where you are and globally. But let, let's try and get some context here about what it is we, he, you have been trying to deal with. So these are latest numbers. These are 24 hours ago, 167 and a half million positive cases, test confirmed cases, three and a half million deaths. So that, that that's like nothing you've ever known. And la last week, the Economist in the UK and John Hopkins University in the US published the first study into excess deaths globally. And these are estimates, of course, but excess, the cause of excess death in 2021 has been COVID, of course. In fact, deaths from other causes have fallen in many, many countries. So these excess deaths suggest that the actual death toll from COVID is 10 million. The global death toll from COVID so far is in the region of 10 to 12 million people. These are real lives, real family, real people who have lost loved ones. So what about us in that leadership position? What, a, what about what we do, how we are? That we are, in collective terms, the quality people. We, we would conventionally have been in a European capital or city thinking about how to move health and healthcare forward using quality and safety and person-centred care and families in the middle and all of those things we love. But what, what does COVID do to that? And this is a, a quote some of you will have come across before, that the true test of leadership is how well you function in a crisis. So what, what has quality given and what can quality learn? So here are, my, here are my three lessons for the COVID response. And lesson number one is to understand, and we'll come to the others in a moment or two, to, to, to understand the pandemic a little. So let, let's think about the global response. This is the grass market in Edinburgh. Many of you will have been in it. It's a mile from the castle. It's a capital city in Europe. It's a big social centre when it's not raining, and even when it is. It's comedy clubs and hotels and cafes and bars and restaurants. And this is what it looks like normally. And this is what it looked like the first week in April 2020. 
And it's what it looked like in the first week of April 2021 when we locked down again. Our response globally, pretty much everywhere, there are some variations on a theme, but pretty much everywhere was to put everybody in their houses. Close the schools, close the offices, close the retail, close pubs and hospitality. And we did that to buy ourselves time because we didn't know what to do. The virus didn't have a name in February, March 2020. We didn't know who it infected. We didn't know who it killed. We didn't know which age groups. We had no treatment. We had no vaccine. We just knew it was a viral respiratory infection that had come originally from China and had swept through a number of routes. The route to here in Scotland was via North Italy and then into Scotland and other parts of the country. Now, the WHO told us roughly what to do, but these are the, these are the headlines rather than the uh, detail. The, we don't have time to do all six of them, but roughly control your epidemic. Make sure you've got test and trace, what we call test and protect in Scotland in place, so you can find the contacts and quarantine them. It's, it's the oldest public health measure in, in history. It's what they did for cholera. It's what they did for leprosy a thousand years ago. Find the infection, isolate it until it gets better, forgive the impersonal nature of that, and stop it infecting other people. That's criteria number two. Number three is protect your vulnerable. Schools, prisons, care homes, hospitals. Number four is protect your workplaces and public transport systems. So alcohol gel, face coverings, things that you have to do in order to make spaces safe, physical distancing. Five is control your borders. Don't export cases and don't import cases. Countries often talk about importation of cases, locking themselves down so they don't import cases. It's actually just as important not to export cases to other parts of the world or even other parts of your own country. That border can be within your own boundaries as well as more externally. And then six, where I've spent quite a lot of my time in translating the rules and regulations the focus, the strategic intent to the public. And that public might be the actual public through media, TV and radio and newspapers, or it might be stakeholder groups. So Alzheimer's Scotland or the Scottish Football Association and all the young people who play football in the country. So what is it we're trying to do though, as we understand this pandemic? We're trying to reduce deaths from coronavirus. And if that were the only exam question that the leaders of the countries asked us, then that'd be fairly straightforward. Get everybody in their houses, send them food parcels and wait for it to pass. But unfortunately, it's not because there are other harms from this virus. And in Scotland, we call that the four harms framework. Every country has a similar version. It's just a way of thinking about the problem. All frameworks are wrong. Some are useful. I think maybe Helen Bevan taught me that. All frameworks are wrong. Some are useful. So you have harm number one, health harm. Harm number two, the harm your response does to the health system. Harm number three, societal harm. And harm number four, economic harm. So let's think very briefly about each of those in turn. These are the weapons we have against harm one, but I would argue also against harms two, three, and four. Test and protect or test and trace system. Healthcare for infection, so that's got better. It's not good yet, but it's got a little better in intensive care and in hospitals. Non-pharmacological interventions, distancing, face coverings, no big gatherings, all of those elements. And then uh, to, to the great credit of the world scientists, vaccines. Harm number one, death. Death and destruction and misery from the virus itself. So these are death data for Scotland, two big waves. And these are people who had COVID-19 on their death certificate. So these are not all confirmed cases, but this is the most accurate data we have for mortality. 10,000 people have died of this disease in Scotland. Harm number one, COVID admissions to hospital. So not all die, but you can see the pattern is very similar. Harm number two, the delay to planned and emergency care. So because we were filled with COVID or adapted for COVID, what did that do? So we end up with the blue line on the bottom, which is planned care for 2020 and 2021 being paused. You could 
that care is still required. That, that's not gone away. We've just postponed it. We've just added it to a queue. And every country has added to their queue. The emergency admissions at the top, slightly more complex. That's sometimes deferred care. Sometimes it's care that wasn't required because people weren't out. They didn't crash their cars. They didn't have as many accidents. But some of that is people not coming to hospital with strokes or heart attacks and therefore not being in the health system. Harm number three, societal harm. You could, you could do a, a thousand graphs in here about the harm we've caused by closing schools, the harms we've caused by stopping visiting in care homes. This is crisis grants in social care. So people who apply to social work departments to get money to put food on the table or to dress their children. And that has doubled in the period of the severe lockdowns. And then harm number four, economic harm. Unemployment rate doubled in the first wave of the virus and will take five years to recover. Each country could show similar graphs. So you have to understand your problem. I, I think the first step in an improvement framework, an improvement process, the Scottish improvement process has this as its key first step. Understand your system. What is it you're trying to fix? Lesson number two is to lead. So jump in. There is no greater purpose just now in health and care than trying to help your piece of the puzzle respond to COVID and then renew from COVID, which is a whole different lecture. You'd have to have me back another time if you want the renewal lecture, which is available. My problem here is that leading in this crisis felt like this. This is Homer Simpson, those of you who don't follow the Simpsons, but I didn't feel equipped. I, I, didn't, I didn't feel I knew what to do. And it turns out that everybody you speak to in COVID response felt exactly the same. No, none of us were ready. None of us were prepared. None of us had trained for this particular set of circumstances. So it felt a little bit like this. So what, what can you do? Well, there's lots of things you can do, but one of the things you can do is fall back on what you know. And this is a, a relatively well-known IHI framework, and I've, I've used it a lot in quality improvement. In fact, I've lectured on it at this forum in, in other contexts. It's the high-impact leadership behaviour work that Steve Svensson led for IHI many years ago now, where they looked at high-performing health systems around the world and looked not, not at the organisation or the way they were structured, but the individual behaviours of the leaders. So how did people behave in high-performing systems. And these were the five behaviours. So I like this because it's not an organogram. It's not about integration of health and social care or about structures. That, that's important and that's worthy of dis, dis, debate and discussion. But these feel more granular. You can, actually, you can actually think about what these are for you in your context. So let, let's quickly go through them in my COVID context. So we all know person-centeredness is crucial. I, I mean, I've I've, I've made a living at, at talking about care opinion and open visiting and family and patient councils and putting people in the centre. But suddenly my customer changed. My, my person that I had to put in the centre of the decision making and the advice I was giving to the first minister of the country was transformed into the 500,000 people who play community football in Scotland. Young Scott is the key organisation in Scotland that uh, speaks and helps with young people. So they have the most accessible website, most accessed website in the country for young people. Alzheimer's Scotland, you get the idea. So the customer changed, but the principle is the same. The front line changed. So, so it was no longer only about intensive care units. It was, of course, about intensive care units and GP practices and dentists and all of those things that I was familiar with. But it was also buses and trains and call centres and civil service offices and parliaments. And how are you going to make it safe for people to travel to see their grandmother in a care home? So the front line was transformed. And I had to learn, along with hundreds of other people, how to do that. And I had a team of people to help me. And I spent a lot of time with sectors, with the oil and gas sector, with the business sector, with politicians, with others. Behavior number three is relentless focus. And we talk about relentless focus sometimes as, as the quality improvement relentless focus. So keeping the rhythm of improvement going in. In this context, it was about messaging. It was often about repeat the messaging. So I've given 
450 to 500 media interviews in the last year. I've been at more parliamentary committees in a year than I've been at in 10 years prior to this. And that is principally about repeating the message. Now, some of the Scots on this, if there are any Scots left watching, are fed up with that messaging, of course. Even my mother has stopped watching, frankly. But there is something about repeating the message. And this is one of our uh, marketing tools. We call it facts, face coverings, avoid crowds, clean hands, two meters and self-isolate facts. And it's on posters all over the country. It's on the TV every night. It's me and others talking about it. It's the relentless focus of the safety messaging, trying to keep the population safe. And we've moved from quality improvement individual system to countrywide. So w what we require is five and a half million people to do this. I've also spent a bit of time in UK messaging, not as much, but trying to keep 60 million people as safe as we possibly can. Behaviour number four, transparency. So we've given, at the beginning of the pandemic, we did daily press conferences with the First Minister, and I did many of them at her side. And now we do weekly, twice weekly, so we have one tomorrow, where I will join the First Minister of the country and we will answer questions from journalists for an hour, an hour and a half, and we will do that live on TV. And we have a dashboard of data that is updated every day at two o'clock, very granular neighborhood level that we would never have published pre-pandemic that's now available to everybody with maps of where the infections are. So you can look at a very local level where the, where the rate is in your particular part of the country. And we've tried, not everybody agrees we've achieved it. We've tried to be as transparent as we possibly can. And then behavior number five, Behaviour number five is boundarylessness, which is a made up Steve Svensson word, but I think you get what it means. It's removing the boundaries in order to respond. You cannot respond to COVID without the police, without the sport system, without community leaders. It's not a health and social care problem. It's everybody's problem. It's a multi-agency problem in partnership with the people of your country. And that's what we've tried to do. So those five behaviours have served me well. They, they came from hell, they came from IHI. But I think there are a model through which we can see some of these challenges. My, my third lesson is to breathe. I, it's 14, 15 months since this began. And if you've done a shift in a care home or a shift in intensive care, or really a shift anywhere in health and care or in education or, okay? or in a supermarket, you're exhausted. It, it's been particularly difficult to, to manage these weeks and months. And you've had to deal with the pandemic in your personal life. You've probably lost family. You may have had challenges in your workplace. You've probably worked from home. You've probably homeschooled kids, all of those other things. And it affects everybody. I've got a great friend who works at a supermarket customer service desk. And if you think eh, that's not the front line of public service, then you need to go spend 24 hours with her. It's very much the front line. Or you may know police officers, or you may know teachers who have had to eh, completely transform the way they work around the world during this pandemic. Now, there are examples of what you can do about that, and we don't have time to do them. Other people at this conference are talking about joy and work and well-being. But the, I think the field hospitals, so-called, in Scotland and in England give us some clues. This is the Nightingale Hospital at the Excel in London, and this is the Louisa Jordan, our version, in Scotland. And those of you who were at the Glasgow 2019 forum will recognise this was the conference centre, and it was, for a year, a massive field hospital. It turned out we didn't need to treat COVID patients there in the end. We did treat a lot of patients there, non-COVID, and it's now a massive vaccination centre. It's our biggest vaccination centre in Scotland. Do you remember the hydro, the big dome building? Well, that uh, is still doing 5,000 vaccinations a day. Uh, and I had my first dose there, and I'm having my second dose there uh, later next week. And uh, But inside these rebuilds, we discovered that if you ask people for help, they come. So companies came and gave us chocolate bunnies and uh, fitness classes and moisturiser for staff and coffee on the way in in the morning for free. And yet we don't, we don't do this 
two miles along the road at Glasgow Royal Infirmary or at the GP practice that you can walk to from, from this field hospital. So we made it special, and that's good. But, but why do we not think in those terms all the time for, for other places, for uh, things that are routine, our supermarkets, our schools, our health and care system? It, the, that same 1919 science article says that it is worthwhile to give more attention to the avoidance of unnecessary personal risks and to the promotion of better personal health. A hundred year old lessons from a pandemic that we can only imagine. But now, unfortunately, we have some more uh, interest and facts from our own version. So those are my those are my three lessons. But I've I've got another one to add. I've used these three before, but as Selena, who helps me think through these things, and I were talking about this this particular presentation, we thought we would take it to an extra level because these uh, this audience was clever, and and think about what what else we might learn here. And it, there was a moment a, a few weeks ago when Selena and I were planning, and and she said, "What what do you think the key lesson is?" And I. In it, I uncharacteristically reflected for a moment, which is not something I do all the time. And my, my answer was that I, I don't think there's a new lesson in the pandemic. I, th I think the lesson is what we've already known. I think the lesson is what Paul Batalden taught me 15 years ago and taught many others during that period. And he learned himself that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So, so the system was what we had. And we've, we've had to adapt and use and grow. And some of that has gone well and really quickly. Some of it has been really, really difficult. So maybe there's a fourth lesson here. And it makes these lessons cyclical. Maybe we can go back around and, and learn from the pandemic as we renew, as, as we think about what comes next and my example here is, is maybe more recent, and I'm going to do this relatively quickly so we still have time for some questions. But those of you who are following COVID will know the WHO has now decided to call the variants of concern across the world by Greek letters. So we in Scotland, like much of the world, are now facing a third wave uh, of the Delta variant, the fourth Greek letter here. Now, our only hope is we don't end up with 30 variants because we're going to run out of letters quickly. But our fourth variant of concern is the Delta variant, worse than the previous three. It is more transmissible. It appears to be causing more severe disease. And we're not sure whether it vaccine escapes, but it certainly vaccine escapes first dose. It doesn't seem to vaccine escape second dose, but it changes the game. It, it changes the nature of what we've had to do. So we've had to go back in the cycle and go again. So Deming's Lens helps us do that because Deming's Lens is about understanding the system. It's about understanding all of the pieces that come together in the system in order for you to make change with that system, with the people, the patients, the families, the citizens to do that. So he, he has a number of steps in there. And the first is to appreciate the system. So this is the First Minister of Scotland visiting a mosque a couple of weeks ago. Delta variant arrives. We know we've got to vaccinate seldom heard communities. So those particularly in ethnic minority groups in Glasgow who are poorer, who are less health literate and weren't getting the vaccine at the high levels we needed. So we understand the system and we send in an intervention. And the intervention on this occasion was the First Minister of Scotland her direct opposition leader, Anna Sawar, who's a Muslim and well known in this Islamic community in the south of Glasgow. But this is the First Minister's electoral constituency, so also well known in this area. So, so you adapt according to understanding the system. We also know that in the postcodes in question, these are the two Glasgow postcodes with the highest incidence a couple of weeks ago, we had to garner and gather all of those boundarylessness groups. And that's what we did. The second is to understand the psychology. So you have to understand vaccine hesitancy. You don't have to spend a lot of time in anti-vax communities, those who are violently opposed to vaccination. But you do have to understand vaccine confidence. So the, the countries in the world with the lowest vaccine confidence are Poland and Japan. So that 
might be a surprise. What well, it came as a surprise to me that those two countries are the least likely to be vaccinated. So Scotland has a relatively significant Polish community. So what do you do in order to persuade that expat community in Scotland to be vaccinated and be encouraged to vaccinate? They're not. They're not violent anti-vaxxers, but they need confidence. So you have to understand the psychology of that intervention. You have to also understand variation. So you use what many of you will have learned, some of you taught me many years ago, about the understanding of variation in both case rates. This is one piece of Glasgow versus another piece of Glasgow. And this is the 100,000 case rate over seven days. <coughs> Excuse me. But when you actually look at this in a different way, you see one piece of Glasgow with big numbers and one piece of Glasgow with relatively small numbers. So your intervention will be different because you've understood variation. So you've appreciated the system. You've understood the psychology of people and how they react to what you're doing, the messaging, the change. And you've also understood the data. But then you also then need to think, what's your theory? What, what is your theory of knowledge? How are you going to change? So that's going to be iterative. You're going to do experiments. You're going to do, but you've got to do it quickly. So the cabinet of the country and the parliament of the country say, well, we need to get vaccination from here to here and we need to do it yesterday. And we need to get the infection rate from here to here and we need to do it quickly. So that is door to door testing. So let, let's quickly test in these postcodes door-to-door -door testing and share that learning with other parts of Northern England, with London, who are struggling with the same variant, etc., etc., so that we don't potentially have to go back to the image on the left that I showed you earlier when we have to shut down society as the only weapon we have left. So these are my four uh, short but uh, inadequately formed lessons from inside the pandemic. I, I have tried to take in what I've learned from quality over the last 15 years and adapt them to this high paced, high stakes world of COVID response. And I'm sure many of you have had a much more granular and frontline experience of that than I have had. But I hope that's relatively helpful. My final piece of advice is if you're ever in a time machine and Doc asks you where you should go, don't go back to 2020. Thank you very much for listening.